being here for my talk. And so as we all know, climate change is here, and from a fisheries perspective, we fear that its impacts are going to be most detrimental for cold water species, hence the theme of this year's meeting. So today I'm hoping that I'll be talking about different behaviors that lake trout have had in response to temperature changes. Um, not so much looking at it from a global warming perspective, but looking at it from seasonal changes. So how temperatures increase from spring through summer and then into the fall. And then potentially using these behaviors as ways of predicting how lake trout might be responding to increased temperatures over the long term due to climate change. So first, some quick background about lake trout. They are a cold water stand there, meaning they have a small temperature preference, usually about six to 13 <coughs> degrees Celsius, and anything above about 15 and a half degrees Celsius is considered unsuitable. They also have a relatively strict dissolved oxygen preference, usually um, surviving waters that have over six milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. And this has caused some limits on their habitat range. So you can see in the figure here, it's really restricted to a lot of the northern part of the northern hemisphere. So looking now more closely at this temperature and dissolved oxygen relationship in temperate lakes throughout the year, you can see that starting in the winter, there's a lot of habitat available for lake trout and other cold water species. But as we get to summer, the surface waters increase or the temperatures increase, dissolved oxygen and the <coughs> hypolimnion decreases and the amount of habitat that's available for cold water species such as lake trout becomes very limited. Uh, it's this idea of a temperature oxygen squeeze that was first thought of in the 1980s. And so at this point in the year, these lake trout and other cold water species have some problems and they might have to find other areas that have suitable habitat if they are available or if those habitats are not available, it's possible that they might face extirpation. But trying to be optimistic, we'll assume that there is other suitable habitat in that area, in which case they might return to the, uh, that original location later in the year once conditions get back to being optimal again. So we were looking at Lake Trout Movement in Lake Champlain, which is a temperate lake that is fragmented by these man-made causeways that were put in place in the mid-1800s and late 1900s. And so the causeways separate different basins in Lake Champlain. You can see we have the main lake in the dark blue, as well as Mallet's Bay and the Inland Sea. So these extensive causeways separate these systems or these basins, although there are some openings that allow fish passage, including fish such as the lake trout. But these openings are relatively small considered to the whole length of the causeway. This causeway was it's about five kilometers long. It has two openings, and the larger of the two openings is about 50 meters and averages about five meters depth throughout the year. These causeways, or the basins also vary in a lot of characteristics, particularly their depth. So Mallet's Bay has a max depth of about 30 meters. The Inland Sea has a max depth of about 50 meters. And then the main lake has a max depth well over 100 meters. So there are also a lot of differences in the temperature and dissolved oxygen of these basins throughout the year. So looking at that a little bit more in depth, this is showing the temperature and dissolved oxygen from 1995 to 2005 for the main lake at various depths, five meter intervals from five meters down to 90 meters. And the main thing to point out is the differences in colors, which represent the different months. And then there's also some circles and axes. And so these represent optimal and suboptimal conditions. So any points that are in that blue box there would be optimal conditions. And you can see all the colors are occurring in that blue box, meaning that throughout this entire period, there is some optimal habitat available for lake trout. In comparison, when we look at Mallet's Bay and the Inland Sea, you see that the colors in the optimal box are really limited to just those uh, earlier, uh, early months. So May through August, maybe a couple points in September, but it's very limited amount of habitat. Now this is looking at the entire water column across 10 years. And this was back from 1995 to 2005. So you can only imagine that this may have gotten worse as time's gone on, and the amount of habitat that's available for lake trout, at least within that optimal range, has been decreasing, and during the later parts of the summer and early fall, might limit the amount of habitat available for lake trout in these basins. However, we know that lake trout have been observed in all three basins. So this led us to the question of, how do lake trout use Mallet's Bay and the Inland Sea? And from that, we wanna know, when are the lake trout present in these areas? 
How long do the lake trout stay there? And lastly, how do the lake trout respond to seasonality, knowing that the temperature and dissolved oxygen vary so much in these two basins and become suboptimal during that point in the year? So in order to answer these questions, we use acoustic telemetry of adult stock lake trout in Lake Champlain, and we tagged 93 adult lake trout with a three-year transmitter, and fish were released in the main lake at a north and south stocking <coughs> site. And any time they swam by one of the 27 receivers, they gave us a, a signal about once every two minutes, and that signal would say, I was at this location or at this receiver at this time, and then we had that information for three years. And one thing I'd like to point out is that while we do have some good coverage of the lake at critical points, there is also a lot of area in the lake that is not covered. So if there's a fish that's in that location, we won't know where it is uh, exactly, we'll just know that it's not showing up at our receivers at that point in time. So one of the first questions was how many fish are actually using Mallets Bay in the Inland Sea? And so of the 93 fish that were tagged, about 20% of them showed up in one of these basins at least once. And it was split pretty well in half with uh, about half of those individuals observed in these basins being in them for less than 10 days, and the other half were really spending a substantial amount of time in these basins, anywhere from uh, 50 days to over an entire year. And so this shows that these individuals are really relying on these habitats for their survival. So I'm going to focus on the later half, or the second half of the population that's focusing, or that's using the two basins more uh, intensively. So I'm going to go through some different behavior, behavior responses now that the lake trout have shown across time. So these plots are going to show the individual location, or the locations of individual lake trout across the time period. And so I'll bring up the locations in a second. I just want to point out that these are the names of receivers in red that are in the Mallets Bay or in the Inland Sea, and the red bars here represent that period where there was suboptimal habitat in Mallets Bay and the Inland Sea. So if you have a point that's in the faded area, or the shaded area, and also in the red coloring, you know that that fish was at a location that would be considered suboptimal. So for this first fish, we see that that actually doesn't happen. It's not occurring in that shaded area. But that's because it's using Mallets Bay for overwinter. And what's really interesting is that it's doing this consist consistently. Each year it's coming back to Mallets Bay right around the same time, right after spawning, and then it's always leaving in early April, mid-April, um, for conditions become suboptimal in Mallets Bay. So if we look at the temperature for Mallets Bay a little more closely, we can see that when the fish was coming in, water temperatures were going to be pretty low. And then it's leaving right when conditions become isothermal. So this individual is never having to experience those suboptimal conditions in Mallet's Bay, but are still able to take advantage <laughs> of resources that might be more abundant in Mallet's Bay, such as prey availability. So a second behavior was an individual that was also going to Mallet's Bay, but this time it was leaving after stratification occurred. Now you'll notice there's never a point that shows so the point here shows when the fish came in through the west causeway here, but we never see where the fish actually left through that west causeway. And that's because there was a much smaller opening in the causeway that this fish seemed to leave through. However, that didn't occur until the end of June. So we know that at some point between the end of June and the time of our next point, which was early October, this fish had left Mallet's Bay. So again, if we go back to that figure looking at the temperatures of Mallet's Bay during this period, you can see that this fish left well after stratification, and this is the opening in the causeway that this fish had to swim through. A very small opening in this causeway, and something that I think is even more incredible is the thymetry around this causeway. So this is a screenshot from Navionics, and to give you a reference of the distance, here's the opening, here's a, a close landmark, and that distance is about one kilometer. Um, numbers on the card throw lines are kind of small, but that's okay because they're in feet, so it's not metric, we don't really care too much about them. But what's important to know is that it's very shallow from right at the opening, it's only about one meter depth. And it only gets to be about seven meters of depth all the way over here, well over a kilometer away from that opening. And it's very similar on the other side going into Mallet's Bay. So here's an individual 
that would have had to swim at least two kilometers through water less than seven meters deep in the end of June. Now, lake trout have something going for them with their larger body mass, so they have some thermal inertia that allows them to potentially go through warmer water without having an increase in their body temperatures. But that's assuming that this fish knew exactly where that opening was and wasn't gonna to have to spend time finding that opening. So really a cool response, but also showing that lake trout might be able to tolerate somewhat extreme temperatures, at least from a lake trout's perspective, for an amount of time allowing it to get from one area that might have optimal conditions to another area. So now the third individual and third behavior that we saw, which I think is the most interesting, was the individual that survived in the inland sea for over an entire year. So this fish was observed entering through the station in the North Inland Sea uh, in the winter of 2015 to 2016, and then we saw it down at the South Inland Sea, and you can see that it survived throughout that period in the South Inland Sea um, potentially traveling a little bit more up into the inland sea out of range of that receiver, but then didn't leave until the following fall, or the following spring, sorry. So it survived throughout that entire suboptimal period. So overall, we saw three different responses of lake trout to these increases in temperature across seasons. There was the individuals that, or there were multiple individuals that had this first response where they used Mallet's Bay across years, but only during overwintering, likely to take advantage of some of the resources, and then left Mallet's Bay before conditions became suboptimal. There was also the individual that was in Mallet's Bay and left after stratification occurred, but used its thermal inertia to allow it to get outside of the bay before conditions within the bay became suboptimal. And then there was a third behavior where there was the individual that was able to survive throughout that entire suboptimal period. But there's also a fourth possible behavior that we observed which are the 80% of the lake trout that never even went into Mallet's Bay or the Inland Sea. Now, whether or not they were truly avoiding these areas because of their conditions, or they were just never going into them because they had all the resources that they needed, is an answer that we can uh, determine, but it's still a possibility that these fish are avoiding that habitat. So coming back to a bigger picture, thinking about how climate change might impact lake trout populations and other cold water species, we see that there might be different responses, and lake trout might respond by adjusting their distribution, so something like remaining in an area where conditions are gonna be optimal, whether that's the 80% of the individuals that never even go into Mallet's Bay or go into the Inland Sea, or the 20% that only use that habitat while conditions are optimal. There also might be changes in the tolerance of lake trout to the unsuitable conditions. So this would be something like that one individual that survived in the inland sea throughout the entire year. Thinking back to the first plenary session this morning, think about how this might relate to that local adaptation and how the possibility for lake trout to adapt to their habitat might change. And then that's also somewhat related to Trevor's talk, looking at that genetic variability and how there might be the possibility for different strains or different populations to have different tolerances of temperature conditions. So one example was from the uh, experimental lakes up in Canada, where in one lake, lake trout might have preferred habitat anywhere from around six degrees Celsius, compared to another habitat where lake trout were observed throughout the summer in 19 degrees Celsius. And this also raises the question of possible differences in tolerance for genetic strains. So for Lake Champlain, there were a lot of different lake trout strains that have been stocked into the lake. So it's possible that the individuals that are using Mallet's Bay, especially the one that survived in the Inland Sea for that entire year, maybe that comes from a specific strain that has a higher tolerance for extreme temperatures or extreme dissolved oxygen. And then lastly, it's important to note that this temperature oxygen squeeze should still be considered by managers, especially because it's a driver of movement and resource use by lake trout. So we saw how the location of lake trout differed throughout the year, or at least for some individuals, in response to these changes in temperature. So if we wanna know how much of an impact lake trout might have in Mallet's Bay, for example, if you look at during the summer and during the winter, those might be completely different responses based on the amount of lake trout are in, that are in there. But also, the impacts of changing temperature might still cause lake trout extirpation, particularly in smaller lakes where they won't have any um, thermal refugia that lake trout could go to during the summer periods when conditions are going to become so optimal. So I'd like to acknowledge the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, uh, Commission with assistance from Senator Leahy, 
for funding for this project, technical assistance from members of the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation System, and also logistic and field assistance provided by members of the Rufus and Ecosystem Science Laboratory. And then also the data for this project were collected by Victoria Pinero. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of you for your time today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.